All right, today we're going to be looking at some NFPA 291 math equations. At the top of the screen here, you have the F1 represents the hydrant you're going to flow, so the flowing hydrant number one, and then the R is the residual hydrant. That's the hydrant you'll stick a gauge in on. Three hydrants, so for instance, if you had a main here and you, and you had three hydrants on it, and say you had water flowing through or either in from each end, don't matter, your residual hydrant, you want it to be centered, so then this could be hydrant, flow hydrant one, flow hydrant two, and then once you got done with your test, you'd just switch, you'd, for your last one, you still need to flow your residual hydrant, so you'd move your residual pressure gauge, this would become your residual hydrant, and then you would flow this hydrant, and just note what you did, so you do end up having to switch things. What cities want is the actual flow test results from the flowing fire hydrant. So they'll want to know the GPMs on this one. And then for the residual hydrant, you need to record the static and residual pressure from a gauge. And the reason you do that is the city wants to know what the projected flow test results of hydrant F1 would be if you flowed so much water out of this that it pulled the residual reading on this hydrant during flow conditions down to 20 PSI. How much could we pull in gallons per minute to drop this to 20? Equations we're going to be using, this top equation, we're going to go through all three of these equations today. This top equation is how you get your gallons per minute. So that's for your first flow test. This second equation here, two different ways of writing it we'll look at, is actually how to interpret the equation you need to calculate your 20 percent. I've got this written in a simplified form here. Don't worry, we're going to get to it. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to record our static pressure on our residual hydrant before we ever start flowing any water during the test. So you can later in this uh, presentation you'll have a chance to pick some numbers but for right now we're going to say that we have a static pressure before we start flowing water of 75 psi so that's going to be our static pressure and then we'll go ahead and hook our test equipment up to it while this person is reading that and it's best to have two people and uh, be able to have hand signals or radios to communicate and you can't, you know, if you can't see one another, you've got to communicate. Because the next step is once you've taken this reading, you give the signal to this person here, and they'll open this hydrant up all the way, and you need to flow it for 60 seconds or until the water runs clear. Now, if you're using a hose monster or something, be sure and have the pedo pointed away uh, in there. And you're, uh, if you have a hose monster, you'll know what I'm talking about. I have flowed hydrants before, and when I opened them up, I actually filled the fire hose full of rocks. So you want to flow this thing in case there's some debris in there because you don't want to destroy your pedo meter. All right, so now you're flowing this water. This person over here is watching the pressure gauge on the residual hydrant. Once this pressure gauge stabilizes and your water is running clear and it's been 60 seconds, if you have clear water and it's been 60 seconds, go ahead and give them the thumbs up. At that time, they'll check their gauge and see if it is, the pressure is stabilized. That will be your residual pressure. So at the same time they read that, we'll say that's 55, you're going to take a reading with your pedo down here. And we'll say your pedo pressure was 25. And this 55 is your residual. All right, after that, you slowly close this hydrant and then they'll just watch this and make sure it returns to normal static pressure everything's good allow this hydrant time to drain before you put the caps on because if you put the caps on and tighten them down before this hydrant drains it won't allow air to come in and allow the water to drain out of the hydrant so hydrants get up to one hour to drain all right the pedo readings should be between 10 and 30 psi for accuracy used to they said 10 and 40, but they've changed it. And the code books do change every few years, so you should stay up to date and uh, read them. If your pedo reading 
is less than 10 PSI, then you need to use a smaller test orifice. If it's greater than 30 PSI, either use a larger orifice or open up more outlets. If you use multiple outlets, note it on the report and combine the gallons per minute. So looking at the two bottom fire hydrants here, say if you're flowing just one hydrant, you'll pedo, you'll take your pedo reading, there's your pedo, handheld pedo tester, you'll take it off of this side and you could, you could put a valve here with a, a play pipe over here, you'll, you'll have to do that to, in order to do this to get your static pressure. So you get your static pressure, then you'd open up your uh, valve or your play pipe here, and then you're going to take your, once you have flowed for a minute, you got clear water, and your residual pressure stabilizes, then you would read this hydrant and just note that it was one fire hydrant where you put your gauge and pedo. Now, say you had additional or uh, you have multiple fire hydrants, in that case, say you flow this outlet here, and you, you take a reading on it, and it's greater than 30. So you're getting 50 pounds out of it. And this hydrant here is capped off. So you've got your gauge over here. You're getting 50 pounds on this. Well, then you need to just go ahead. You'll stop this. You'll set up to flow two outlets at once, and then you'll open this wide open, and you'll take a reading from this side while they're taking a stat, uh, residual pressure reading. And then you'll take another reading from this side and they'll take another residual pressure reading to make sure they, they fairly match. And then you'll combine the gallons per minute from this test and this test here. So say you had uh, your pedo reading of uh, 15 over here during that test and say this pedo reading here was 17 on the pedo you would convert those into gallons per minute add the two gallons per minute together and that's what you would do for uh, flow test number one on that before we can calculate we need to know a few things first off we'll look at nozzle coefficients so common fire hydrants you have three different types the one on the left here has a nozzle coefficient of 0.9. We'll learn what these are later. And the way you tell is the inside of this will be smooth. And this is an exaggerated view, but it's smooth and then the ends up it'll be kind of be the rounded off or a chamfered edge or something like that. That'll get a 0 0.90 unless you get manufactured data that says otherwise. The second type is a hydrant with a, a uh, friction coefficient of 0.80. That would be a hydrant. It's smooth on the inside, but the opening comes to a sharp corner. So those would be 0.80. And then some old hydrants you might find that potentially the um, insert for the hose would actually protrude into the barrel of the fire hydrant. So this, what we're looking at here, this is the internal portion of the hydrant inside of here. So this actually will stick into the body of the fire hydrant. And just for clarification, these pictures, so there's a fire hydrant. These pictures here are representing one half of a fire hydrant, and the blue part is representing the water in the body of the hydrant that's flowing out. So that's how you'd find those. Or refer to the manufactured data sheets. Now, if you're using nozzles, you have to put a play pipe on it. You're not just testing the outlet. Smoothbore nozzles could be anywhere from sometimes 0.96 to a 0.98 coefficient. Underwriter's play pipes may be 0.97. A sprinkler head could be 0.75. The point is, do not guess. When in doubt, if you can't find manufacturer's data, measure the orifices and take pictures of them and document everything because if you wind up in court you're going to want the information because something could happen and then the other thing maybe they say well you know the previous test results these are way different what did you do well rather than having to go back out and send somebody to relook at the uh, coefficients and things like that if you've taken a picture somebody might look at that and say no you made a mistake I disagree and they may assign it a different coefficient 
and redo the equations and maybe it matches last time or maybe you do it right this time and then they look at the last report and they look at your pictures and say no you did it right your test is good maybe the last person assigned the wrong coefficient so documentation is key when doing stuff like this here's the equation to figure out the gallons per minute that you're flowing from a fire hydrant the 29.84 is a constant that number will not change it's a constant number that's why they call it constant the variables in other words, the letters, they represent basically unknowns. You know, think of them as question marks, but if you put a bunch of question marks, you wouldn't know which one you were talking about. So the Q is represented for gallons per minute. So we're trying to find Q, the gallons per minute. To find that, you'll take 29.84, you'll multiply that by C, which is the nozzle coefficient, multiply that times D, which is the diameter of the test orifice, which will be two and a half, and then the square root of, or, and you'll actually you'll square that uh, diameter, the nozzle coefficient, and you multiply that by the square root of the pressure on the pitot. We have our first fire hydrant, or our F1. We have a pitot reading of 25. We have a static pressure before the test of 75 and a residual of 55. We're trying to find the gallons per minute. So our nozzle coefficient, we will pick a, uh, nozzle coefficient of 0 0.90 from that first hydrant we looked at. We'll assign that for C. The diameter of the flow outlet, we're just flowing one two and a half inch, it's 2.5 inch diameter hose outlet. And then our pitot pressure was 25 PSI read on the pitot. And also, I learned something recently, another term for pitot pressure could be stagnation pressure. That's not the same thing as static. Static pressure is the pressure under normal conditions on a fire main without a hydrant flowing. But stagnation pressure is another term for pitot pressure, but in the fire protection trade, we use pitot pressure. So first off, we'll, we'll rewrite this. We'll go, let's pick a different color. We'll go Q equals 29.84, try to follow along on your calculators. C will be a 0.9, or we can put 0 0.90 in there, it doesn't matter. You can leave the zero off. Times, so we'll put parentheses, and if you, you can enter it into your calculator if you want. Well, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Sometimes you can get messed up. So the next one is D, our diameter was 2.5 inches. And we're going to square that, and then we're going to multiply that times the square root of the pressure, which was 25. Now, there's a couple ways you could do it. If you know how to punch it in your calculator from one end to the other and use your parentheses, and then if you're, you're putting your parentheses in, you can put the multiplication symbol between them. Uh, I'm just, or you could, you could just enter it and see if you get what I get. If you can't, or if you get the wrong thing, try this. So we're gonna, there's a way to do this to where we just simplify and we'll bring this down. So 2.5 squared is what? That would be 6.25. All right, so we got 29.84 times 0.9 times 6.25 times. Now what's the square root of 25? Work that out, that comes down to five. All right, so you multiply straight across, and then you'll get what? If you didn't get that, take a second and rework it. Variables. Your calculated gallons per minute, if you float enough water from the flowing fire hydrant to drop it to the residual pressure on the residual hydrant to 20 PSI. So this is generally the cities are going to want you to calculate for the 20 PSI. So that's what that, that first number is. So this is your theoretical flow that you're gonna calculate if you were flowing enough water from the flowing hydrant to drop the residual pressure on the residual hydrant to 20 PSI. And we're just picking the number 20 because that's generally what they require. QF is gonna be gallons per minute from the flowing hydrant during the flow test. Now we just worked the equation out and we had a 0.9, um, coefficient 
we had a 2.5 diameter outlet and 25 on the pitot, so that's that was the equation we just worked. And the answer to that equation would go where QF is in the upcoming equations. PS, think of pressure, static. So static pressure, pressure static, taken from the residual hydrant before you flowed. So it's taken during this test up here. Pressure dropped, as in pressure dropped to the residual pressure you want to calculate for. For example, 20 PSI is what they're going to require. And that's, that's where I'm showing you that up there. P sub R, so you can say P sub S, P sub D, P sub R because the R is below the P. Pressure of residual reading on the residual hydrant during the flow test. Remember when we flowed that hydrant, we did our static, which was 75, and our residual we measured was 55 on the residual hydrant, and our flowing pressure was 25. And in the equation in NFPA 291, they don't show these. I'm gonna show you where they get these numbers for. They show these, but what are these numbers? Well, the HR is gonna be PS minus PD, so it's going to be, HR will be your static pressure minus your residual pressure, and then H sub F is going to be your static pressure minus the pressure read of residual reading on the residual hydrant during the flow test. So let's work this out, and you can, you can do, you can insert different pedo numbers here, so if you want to give it a shot here, We'll go ahead and instead of 25, let's just uh, make this uh, number here 35. Try and see what you would get there. And go ahead and pause here. And I'll give you the answer in 3, 2, 1. Okay, the answer to that would be 993 gallons per minute. And there may be a decibel there too. Uh, but if we put... 45 in there instead of 35. What would it be? I'll give you the answer here in 3, 2, 1. And that Q is going to equal 1126. Hopefully you're getting the right answers at this point. Now, that was part one. What about the desired flow at 20 PSI, residual pressure? On the residual hydrant. Well, we're not going to flow so much water to where we're going to actually drop the city mains down to 20 psi. In a lot of cases, if they have good water supply, um, you know, you just want to get your pedo below 30. And if you get it down to, you know, 20 pounds or something like that, well, you're fine. But maybe you're, you know, we had that higher residual pressure. Well, instead of flowing a bunch more outlets to actually get the city main down to 20, we do the math. The desired flow is they desire to know what the flowing hydrant would flow if you were flowing so much water, as in how many gallons per minute, it would flow if you flowed so many gallons per minute that it dropped the residual pressure on the city main to 20 PSI. So that's what we're after in this next series of equations, and these were the hardest ones out of the bunch. But we're gonna break this down. Before we get into that, take a deep breath, look at your calculator for a second. You need to learn how to do your data entry or your number entry or whatever on your calculator. So if you were gonna do a square root, say the square root of nine, you may have a button on your calculator. Most likely it will look like that, or it may look like that. And there could be an X or a Y in there. And they don't, and they, you don't want to use one if it's got another variable in front of it. There's two different buttons on a lot of calculators, but that'll be the one. So you'd press a button that looked like that, for instance. We'll take one out of the way. So we press this button. And then press 9. And you may have parentheses pop up, and then you'll end parentheses, and you hit equals. So we press the nine, and then the equals button, and then we get three. Okay, if you wanted to do three squared, you press three, and then you may have a button that is an X two. So that will automatically put a square up there. Now later on in the presentation, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. 
So what if this is not a 2? What if that is 25 or, or 3.3 3 to the power of 0.25? In that case, what you would do is you would go push the 3 button. Then you would push, generally it's going to look like that. So you, the Y is going to represent the 3 and the X is going to represent the unknown variable. And then you could push in 0.25 equals. So go ahead and try that. And you'd get basically 1.31607 and it just it's a long number and you'd keep going so hopefully you got that if you got that far you're, you're good to go and then of course you have parentheses start and stop and the buttons could look you know like parentheses so you may use that on your calculator and when we're simplifying remember please excuse my dear aunt Sally parentheses exponents and square roots multiplication division addition and subtraction are done in that order so if we had this problem over here we could to pre-simplify you don't go one plus you don't make this 2.5 or 3.5 and square it you go 2.5 squared so what's 2.5 squared it's 6.25 we found that out already and then we add one so the answer to this 6.25 plus 1 and then that's going to equal 7.25 so let's look at how to pre-simplify something how to uh, do a little bit of order of operations here so please excuse my dear Aunt Sally so parentheses will be work first exponents and square roots then multiplication then division then addition then subtraction so to work this problem out and simplify it we're going to go parentheses first 2 plus 3 we'll bring that down and we're going to make that a 5 exponents the exponent so 3 to the power of 2 or 2 or 3 squared rather is 9 we'll bring that down and there no and then the, also we've got exponents and square roots so square root of 25 is 5 we're going to bring that down and then the rest of this can all just uh, fall in place here so we did our uh, exponent we did our square root now we can do a multiplication so multiplication 2 times 3 is 6 and then we'll do our division so we got to bring down we'll do our division symbol we'll bring down and go ahead and bring down this here so now we've got one division problem in here. Five divided by one is five. Then we'll just bring down everything else. So now we have five plus nine is 14, plus six is 20 plus 5 is 25 and 25 minus 2 would be 23 would be the answer if you didn't get that go back and try again all right so if I in the flow test we flowed 839.20 gallons a minute with 75 static and 55 residual this is the equation out of NFPA 291 they've used forever for doing this it's a little bit complicated of what they're asking first off so QR is the flow what they're they say is flow predicted at desired residual pressure that is the gallons per minute you would get from the flowing hydrant if you flowed enough to drop the residual pressure at the residual hydrant to 20 psi now QF and that's the number they're wanting you to tell them over here for your theoretical calculation now qf is the total flow during test so it's the gallons per minute that you flowed during the test if you had to flow multiple outlets you add them together to get that one gpm the total gpm flowed or to when they say flow 
they mean gallons per minute. HR is a pressure drop to re desired residual pressure. That means it's the recorded static pressure during the hydrant flow test minus the residual you are calculating for, which is we're in this case we're going to be shooting for what if we got 20 psi residual on the main, how much water would we get? So HR is what you recorded for static pressure, subtracting the residual you're calculating for. And H sub F, pressure drop measured during test, that is actually the static pressure you recorded. So you recorded static pressure minus the residual pressure you recorded during the test. So this right here is the equation out of the book. The way they derived these, this is a simplified equation. The actual equation to get this answer, Q sub R, is actually this equation below, which is a little easier to understand, believe it or not. And then you can rewrite it for simplification. You can rewrite it like that because you have an exponent is to the power of 0.54 and to the power of 0.54. Since this is the same exponent above and below the division line, because this is a fraction here, and that fractions that means divide, same thing. Since this exponent is the same, you can take, get rid of that down here, and then make one big parenthesis, and you can rewrite the equation to where it looks like QR equals QF times parentheses PS minus P sub D divided by P sub S minus PR in parentheses to the power of 54. You might want to snap a picture of that with your cell phone or something. So what are we going to do? How are we going to work this out? So remember here is what the variables mean kind of got an abbreviated format here so what was our original static pressure in the earlier flow test we had 75 originally and then our flow test gallons per minute so this this flow test up here is that what we're going to do on this test so that qr goes over here but this qf that's the flow test originally what did we flow during that first flow test? We flowed 839.25 gallons per minute. Now, the pressure drop to, this is a residual you're required to calculate for us. So for NFP 291, it's 20 PSI. Most cities are going to want you to calculate to 20. So we'll just take the number 20. We'll put it there. And then residual pressure during your flow test was what? It was 55 PSI. So that's what those numbers mean. Now we'll rewrite our equation here. So we're going to go Q sub R equals, now Q sub F is 839.25 gallons per minute times, throw some parentheses up here, PS. So PS, after a static pressure, it's going to be 75 minus, now what was PD? That's the residual we're calculating for, 20, divided by PS is our static again. PR was our residual during our flow test. That's 55 in our parentheses, put our exponent up here. So, so far so good. Now we'll go ahead and work this out. So 75 minus 20 is what? We're going to be bringing this down. We'll have 55 over 75 minus 55 is 20. A 
839.25 GPM times, it's going to be for QR. Now, just for saving time, you can go ahead and enter this into your calculator is 839.25 times parentheses 55 divided by 20 in parentheses and the uh, not, not squared, why did I say squared, to the power of 0.54. Uh, you can enter this into your calculator and go ahead and work that out. Or you could go ahead and convert this into a decimal and then do this root or this, uh, this power here, exponent with it. But this would be a really long number and this is, this is one reason we use calculators. So if we had uh, flow 25 with a 0.9 or we had a pitot of 25 with a 0.9 coefficient of discharge, two, one two and a half inch outlet, we'd have got 839.25 gallons per minute. So we're gonna round this number here to the closest gallon per minute when you get your answer. If your static was 75, your residual was 55, we flowed 839.25, we should get a reading of 1,449 gallons per minute. Now, how close did we get to that? This would be a good time for everybody to check their answers and stuff like that. All right, moving right along. If we backed up a minute, since we, we know this already, so that's, that's, we got our answer already. Now let's work if we actually know what HR and HF is out of the book. Same thing. So it's a simplified way of writing the equation. Instead of putting two uh, variables up here with subtraction, we're just actually doing it ahead of time. So same problem, going to be the same answer, but try it like this. See if you can enter it in. So our QF is 839.25 times... And then HR was what? PS minus PD. So it was static minus the residual to calc for. So 20 from 70 or 75 take away 20. 20 from 75, same thing, right? Is what? That's going to be 55. And then for HF here, HF is PS minus PR. So static minus our residual. So 75 minus 55 is going to give us 20. This just basically goes to and then you're back to the same equation again. So if we go back and we look at this equation here, notice we get down here and we've got the same thing. So at this point after we work that out, we got to this equation we got to this part so there was just a step before that and that uh that can get kind of confusing sometimes all right if water flows fast enough there would be no pressure on the pipe walls Some food for thought for a second i'll show you why in a few what if residual pressure was higher i've seen that happen what could be that cause pause here and discuss if you want to. That could be something like a pump kicked on. This we're going to look at Brownian motion and there's some uh, equations by Bernoulli and things but I'm not gonna go into those equations. Round two. Let's flow another fire hydrant and see if you learned anything out of the last one unless you want to take a break right now. Say we've got a fire hydrant. Hydrant one again. This time we do our test, we have a static of 78, residual of 35, and we have 12 on our pitot. So we're going to pick a 0.9 coefficient, so let's rewrite this problem, Q equals, and see if you can get to it faster than I can. C is coefficient of discharge, going to be 0.9. D is going to be 2.5 squared, and our pressure is going to be on the pedo will be the square root of 12. So give you
you a second to get that. And if you did your math right, with a pitot pressure of 12, 0.9 coefficient, flowing one two and a half inch outlet, you should get 581 gallons per minute. And just uh, round to the closest gallon per minute. Round three. Now let's try this again. So for that same hydrant test we just did. So QF is going to be 581 gallons a minute, which is what we just got, right? Times. Now what is our HR? PS minus PD, that'll be 58. So we're going to put HR is 58. And then our HF is our static pressure minus our residual from the previous flow test. So this is going to be 43. To the power of 0.54. So go ahead and work that out. And let's see what you come up with. QR equals... 683 gallons per minute and that's rounded to the nearest gallon all right let's look at uh, why we're doing things and getting what we're getting a couple things here for a minute first say you got a pipe this top pipe up here and you got some uh, if you had no flow and this pipe was full of water the pressure would be the same in all these gauges everywhere in that pipe it, it's like this pipe here if this if these uh, molecules and atoms are not moving they're they're bumping into one another this is a brownie and brownie in motion uh, just little pieces inside of a container the molecules are just they're bombarding one another and they're, they're just moving and the higher the temperature the faster they move and that's why when you heat something up the pressure increases so if we start pushing water we're going to be coming through here, going along, and say we're going at uh, one foot per minute in the big pipe, and say we're putting, we're having to shove it through here, is it going to go, if you got, if you got, say this pipe and this pipe are the same size, or, and we're, we're going to go one feet per minute for velocity, or you could say, you could also do it and say, hey, we're going to do a hundred GPM. So 100 gallons per minute going in here is going to be 100 gallons per minute coming out here. This pipe's not leaking. Nobody's pumping anything into it. So how many gallons per minute is going to be going through here? 100 gallons a minute. Do you think it's going to be faster? Well, of course, the water's got to speed up to put 100 gallons a minute through a smaller orifice. So say it's going one foot per minute in this portion of the pipe. Maybe it's going 100 feet per minute through this little portion of pipe and then it slows back down to one foot per minute through here you still got a hundred gallons a minute going through every portion of the pipe but the speed greatly increases what would the pressure gauges be let's say if this gauge here was reading right in the middle say it was just pick a number any number 100 pounds is it comes up here you know there's a certain amount of pressure pushing on this pushing to overcome friction loss and then this water is going to be squeezed down and going to be sped up so that means you're going to get some high pressure in this really high pressure and then it's going to get in here and eventually boom it's going to hit velocity higher velocity and at that point the molecules are rushing by the sides of the wall so fast so now you're going to have a low pressure zone and then as it comes out the other side and it starts to slow down again, the molecules are able to touch the sides of the pipe more. So at that point, your pressure is going to be starting to come up a little bit. And then, of course, if it was pouring out over here, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get up the same pressure because it, it's never going to get exactly the same pressure it was here because you're going to have some flowing friction loss pressure but it will increase 
back from where it was here. You can actually flow it past enough. If you put this, hook this in the right spot, maybe could be here, could be right here. You could actually flow water through there and you could pull a vacuum on that gauge. That's how carburetors in cars work, is a venturi in there. That's why the uh, cooling towers for uh, nuclear power plants are shaped like an hourglass. That's a big venturi. So the biggest ones I know of are the cooling towers and nuclear power plants. So why does all this happen? Well, it's this Brownian motion. We said earlier that if this wasn't flowing, say this gauge was at 100, these things are just bouncing around in here. But what if they started moving? Well, think of it like this. You got a bowling alley down here. Let's say we got some bumpers in here because we're not very good bowlers and we hit the gutter every time. But we're better than our kids. So our kids roll a ball and they're like, they're going through there and they're just all over the place with that ball. And it's like this, side to side to side to side to side. And say it takes them from the start time, we'll call it time one, and we'll call this time two, time three. Now their amount of time for it to travel this amount of distance. Say this takes their ball 10 seconds to here and another 10 seconds to there. Will it hit the wall 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 times in a 20 second period? Well, that's a lot of force on the walls of those lanes. Now say you get up there. So you get up there and say, out of my way, kid. Let me show you how it's done. Now you come over here. And remember, they had 20 seconds and they hit the wall 14 times. So their 20 seconds of flowing, you know, they weren't moving left to right very fast. It was taking them 20 seconds. So you get up here and you're just, boom, you hit one time and go. Now it takes your ball two seconds to go through there. And you only tap the wall once. Well, it's the same ball that went through the same lane, but you only came in contact with the edge one time. If these molecules start going, you know, these molecules are always moving. See, your ball could have been moving left to the right at the same speed the child's bowling ball was, but it's also moving forward at a much greater rate. So if there's, say they took 14 seconds to go and they hit 14 times and you took one second to go and you hit once, there's the difference. So these are moving, bouncing around at the same rate. However, instead of bouncing and keeping that gauge reading 100 pounds there as these things are going down that pipe it's glancing blows you know so they're not coming into contact as often with that gauge so that gauge is going to be lower and if you had a straight pipe and you flowed fast enough you could actually have zero pressure there it would shoot by that hole so fast that it wouldn't squirt out Whereas if it was just you walked up to a sprinkler system, pulled the gauge out, the water would spray everywhere. So that is how your venturis work.